Okay, class, I thought we should have story time. So I'm going to read a story to you. I'm going to back up just a little bit and backtrack what we had the last time I read, and then we'll read the story a little bit from the bronze bow. Daniel scowled down the road. The very sight of them makes me lose my head. Filthy foreigners, if you hadn't been with me, you'd have lost your silly head for good. How would that serve your country? All right, he burst out. I made a fool of myself. Do you want to go back now? Certainly not, she sprang to her feet. I want to go see Leah. So they went on, Daniel keeping his eyes on the road ahead. But presently, stealing a furtive glance at the girl beside him, Daniel discovered she was looking directly at him. I might as well be honest, Daniel, she said unexpectedly. Back there, I was proud of you. Scared to death, but proud too. If I were a boy, I hope I'd have that courage. The frank words took Daniel by surprise. He could feel the pleasure of them spreading, warm as wine, along his veins. He had never had much praise in his life, and he didn't know what to make of it. As they climbed the first rise from the plain, a breeze stirred their hot faces. On every side, the land stretched brown and parched under the summer sun. Here and there, a solitary thresher still moved in a field, tossing the grain in great forkfuls into the air, letting the breeze catch the chaff while the heavy grain fell back to the ground. Presently, they reached the village. Outside his own door, Daniel knocked and called out, and presently the bolt inside was quietly drawn back. As Daniel pushed open the door, Thasia stood back. I have brought a friend of yours with me, Daniel announced. Leah, from the corner where she had retreated at the first glimpse of an unfamiliar figure, stared out into the road. Then her face lighted. Thasia, she cried, why are you dressed in Joel's clothes? Thasia came into the room, laughing and pushing back the hot turban with relief. It's lucky everyone doesn't have your sharp eyes, she said. You won't give me away, will you? It's a, it's a sort of game we're playing. Leah came forward slowly. Daniel never plays games, she said soberly. What a pity, said Thasia lightly. Joel and I pretend all sorts of things. But I'll tell you a secret. Your brother does know how to smile. Quite nicely, actually. He doesn't always hide behind that fearful scowl. Unexpectedly, Leah giggled, and then both girls were laughing, scowling more fiercely than ever. Daniel stamped into his shop, but he left the door open behind him. In Thasia's lighthearted presence, Leah was a different girl altogether. As he worked, Daniel caught, between the hissing of the forge and the blows of his hammer, the sound of their voices, and over and over again, Leah's soft laughter. When he crossed the room for a tool, he could see them, the two heads, dark and fair, bent over a bit of sewing. He found a good many excuses for walking across the shop that morning. At noon, they ate their bread together. Leah spread out with pride the hard bread and the olives and the inferior dates, not knowing how meager the fare really was. With every bite, Daniel remembered the fine white cloth the damask couches, the wine in alabaster cups. But Thasia seemed to have forgotten. What was there about her, he wondered, a sort of naturalness that made her seem, without the slightest effort, to belong, no matter where she happened to be, on the mountain, in the luxury of her own home, out among the fishing boats, her gaiety touched with special grace, everything around her. Leah had begun to clear the dishes when some sound distracted her. Daniel, leaning back on his elbows, only half awake in the heavy heat, caught first the look on his sister's face. She was staring through the open door of the shop. A deep flush was rising slowly from her throat in her pale temples. Daniel sat up. Then he caught 
the flash of sunlight on a helmet. The pleasure of the moment exploded like a bubble. In an instant, he was on his feet, had flung himself into the shop and slammed the door shut behind him. He had thought he had seen the last of the blonde Roman. What had brought the man back? Curse him, too, for choosing to bring his work in the heat of the day. In a black humor, he blew up the fire. When the shadows began to lengthen in the little room, they all knew with regret that the visit must end. Before they set out for the city, Daniel took Thasia into his shop. You have brought so many gifts to Leah, he said, trying to choose his words carefully. Would you let me give one to you? He reached into a small niche in the wall and drew out a small object wrapped in a fragment of Leah's blue cloth. Awkwardly, he laid it in Thasia's hand, the little brooch. I made it with a bit of scrap, he said. Thasia stood looking down at it. A bronze bow, she whispered. Do you remember? It was you who thought of it that night that the bronze bow might mean some impossible thing, the thing we could not do alone. I never forgot it. I don't know how to say it, but it came to stand for everything we are working for, for our, for our oath, for the kingdom. He had never seen Thasia before when she could not speak. He would remember as long as he lived the look that sprang into her eyes and was quickly hidden as she bent her head. Then her words came hurrying out. To think that you made it, she exclaimed, her voice shaky. Why, why, Daniel, you ought to be a silversmith. You shouldn't be working with these great chunks of iron. I, I'd like to try, he confessed. Perhaps someday when we are at peace. It was the first time he had ever voiced his ambition even to himself. They set out together along the road, Thasia with the turban snugly about her head once more. Every time I come, Leah has changed, she told him. It's like watching a flower opening very slowly. From week to week, I can hardly wait to see how, how it has opened since I saw her last. It is due to you, Daniel told her humbly. She has never had a friend before. After you leave, I see her trying to do things the way you do them. Thasia smiled at him. Little thing, she said, her hair and the way she folds her veil. That's not what I mean. She does almost all the work in the house now, he went on, but there are days when she goes back. He was grateful for a chance to speak of this to someone. Days when she doesn't pay any attention. It's hard for me to have patience enough. Thasia smiled again. No, no one would ever take you for a patient man, she said. But do you think Joel and I do not know what you have done for Leah? Daniel's gratitude went out to her. He would like to think he had done something to make up for those years. She's lovely, Thasia went on thoughtfully. I can't believe there are really any demons in her. Have you ever asked a physician? The one in the village said there was no cure for her. Once there was a man traveling through the country who had magic power to heal, and my grandmother paid him to look at Leah. He couldn't do anything either. He said that the demons that make a person afraid are the hardest to cast out. He said something queer. Leah was only a child, but he said that she did not want to be made well. Thasia was silent for a moment. I have heard Jesus say something like that when people ask him to cure them. Once there was a lame man on a litter, Jesus bent over him and looked right into his face and asked him, do you want to be whole? It seems such a queer question. Why would anyone want to stay a cripple? Daniel hesitated. This was something he had thought about. Walking alone on the dark silent road from Beth Bethsaida, he was not sure of his own thoughts. Haven't you ever wondered, he attempted, what good it is for them to be healed? These people that Jesus cures. 
They're happy at first, but what happens to them after that? What does the blind man think when he has wanted for years to see, and then he looks at his wife in rags, and his children all covered with sores? And the lame man you saw, is he grateful now? Is it worth it to get on his feet and then spend the rest of his life dragging burdens around like a mule? I never thought of it that way, said Thasia, her eyes clouding. Is that why? Do you think that so many of them aren't cured? The thought was troubling to them both. They walked on in uncertain silence. Then Thasia, naturally happy, Thasia's naturally happy spirits reasserted themselves. Have you thought, Daniel, of taking Leah to Jesus? Yes, I've thought of it, but I don't see how I could get her to Capernaum without frightening her to death. She asked once if Jesus would ever come to our village, but I don't suppose she would really have the courage. When he comes, if she will not go to him, then you must ask him to come to your house with you. He often goes with people, you know, to the centurion's house or to some rich man's. Do you really think that would make the slightest difference to Jesus? No. No, I guess it wouldn't. But somehow I wonder, it's the same as the lame man. It's not much of a world, is it? Is it worth trying to bring Leah back into it? Thasia stood still in the road. Yes, she cried, and Daniel was astounded to see that tears had sprung up in her eyes. Oh, Daniel, yes, if only I could make you see somehow that it is. All this, she exclaimed, the sweep of her arm including the deepening blue of the sky. The shining lake in the distance, the snow-covered mountain far to the north. So much. You must look at it all, Daniel, not just at the unhappy things. Suddenly she reached out and touched his hand. Look, she whispered. He lifted his head and followed her gaze. Overhead, barely discernible against the blue of the sky, a long gray shadow hung suspended. Cranes, hundreds of them, were passing in a great phalanx. They wheeled and caught the sun, flashing light from the banks of white feathers with a shimmering like the snow on the mountains. Motionless, the two watched till the line slowly melted into the distant air. Oh, Thacia let out her breath. How beautiful, she sighed. It is beautiful just to be alive. Daniel looked down at her. Her head was still thrown back, her lips parted. He could see the pulse beating under the smooth ivory skin, and somehow the line of her throat was one with the long, slow arc of birds in flight. She was aware all at once of his look, and then that their hands were joined. Red surged up into the smooth cheeks, and she drew away. For a moment, neither of them moved, and then they began to hurry, almost to run. At the junction of the road, they passed two more Roman sentries, but this time the men did not speak or even take notice of the two dusty boys. For once, Daniel felt almost grateful to a Roman. Tonight, he could not have borne to watch Thasia shoulder a pack. And we'll stop there.